Coming through on the phone. Uh, okay. You coming through on the phone. Uh, Let's stay tuned. Engaged, so to speak, in missions work. He's been engaged 
with sharing Christ all over the world. Now hear that. In verse 21, chapter 21, rather, it says, And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them, Luke is talking now, after we had dismissed from them, after we had uh, left them and had launched, if they had gotten the boat and left uh, Miletus, the Bible says, that Luke says, We came with a straight course unto Cos, and the day following unto Rose, and from thence unto Patara. Uh, imagine a ship uh, bearing passengers uh, for, uh, deep ground, uh, going from port to port. Uh, each port they went to, uh, there were people there, and each point they went to, they would either change boats or they would just pick up more passengers on their way to their final destination. But verse 2 says that they found the ship sailing over to Venetia. In other words, um, it wasn't as if Paul could go online, and, and, and I say this for a reason, not just to be funny. It wasn't if Paul could book a, a, a tour to Jerusalem. Paul was using everything at his uh, disposal to make sure that he got to Jerusalem. So he came to the city of Patara, verse 1, and he found the ship. He said, who's headed uh, in this direction? They said, well, this ship right here is going to Phoenicia. And so the Bible would let us know then that Paul went on board that ship, and he set forth with those believers, I mean with the, with the people on the ship. Now this is what I want us to look at verse 3. Now when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on this, the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed it here. In other words, the, 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 the route of the ship, uh, they saw Cyprus, and maybe it was the first time Paul had seen Cyprus, but he said we left on the left hand, meaning they passed by Cyprus on the left hand, and they sailed straight on to Syria, and they landed at a city called Tyre. This city called Tyre was a, a, a city we've known in ancient times. We always heard there was a city called Tyre and a city called Sidon. And so this was a city that had a great history. And so when Paul uh, and his traveling companions stopped at Tyre, the Bible says, for the ship was to unlay her burden. In other words, some of the, sh- the cargo that's on the ship was to be delivered to Tyre. The reason why was Tyre was a great city of commerce. It was a place where great commerce was done. Um, goods were taken and, and dropped off and picked up. And so when they got to this city, uh, they, it, it was like a layover. They got there while they unloaded the ship. What did Paul do? Verse 4 lets us know that Paul, while they were unloading the ship, Paul uh, got his disciples, his, his traveling companions together, and they went and found the disciples. Look at that right there. I love that. They went and found the disciples. In other words, they touched down in, in Tyre. They got off the ship and said, Who, where the believers at? And so somebody said, the believers over there. And so they went and found the believers there in that city, and they stayed there seven days. In other words, even as Paul, I love the thought of this, Paul is on his way to Jerusalem to his destiny, but on his way, he is still interested in doing what? Interested uh, in encouraging and sharing Christ with others. He found these disciples. He stayed there with them seven days. And if they stayed there with them seven days, they were even aware, prophetically, that Paul was on his way to a very difficult experience. They said here in verse 4 that these disciples, the people, they had never, he had never known them, didn't know them, because there's no indication up to verse 20, chapter 21 that there were believers there, which is indicative of the fact that the Christianity was spread so fast uh, and so far uh, that Paul knew that there were believers there. Maybe he didn't know them, but he knew there were believers there. When he got there, these people said to Paul through the Spirit, and that's what's important, through the Spirit. In other words, it was inspired by the Spirit. They said, Paul, you should not go to Jerusalem. You should not leave it. Stay here with us. Don't go to Jerusalem. There's too much, too many problems there for you. Verse 5 says, when he accompanied them, accomplished these days, after seven days, that they departed and went on their way, continued on their way to Jerusalem, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children. Now listen to this in verse 5. When they were prepared to leave this city called Tyre, when they were leaving Tyre, they were going back to the, 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 the docks where they had gotten off the ship there. And the whole entirety of all the believers, all the disciples in Tyre, came. And this is what it says in verse 5. With all their wives and all their children, there was a big crowd of people to see Paul and his traveling companions off. They, and it was a custom at the time to follow a person that was, had been visiting with you, to follow them to the outskirts of the city. Um, they did, as custom would, would, would dictate, follow Paul and his traveling companions out to the city. But what they did next was uniquely, uh, uh, uniquely uh, connected with Christianity. Because when they got to the very edge of the city, the Bible says that they kneeled down on the shore and prayed. I want y'all to picture that for a second. Paul, don't leave, don't leave, stay here. Prophets in Jerusalem, Paul said, no, I got to go. Okay, Paul, we're going to walk to the end of the city. They get to the edge of the city. But this is what I like. They kneeled down on the shore and prayed. They had a prayer meeting uh, right at the outskirts of the city, right at the shoreline, right at that place before Paul boarded the ship. One of the things I think as Christians we must understand is that that wasn't just routine. That wasn't ritual. That was a prayer of compassion. 
And if I can it picture it in my spiritual eye, it was Paul praying for the believers there in Tyre, and the believers in Tyre praying there for Paul. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that as children of God, we ought to always do what? Pray with one another, particularly as we're about to dismiss from one another. One of the, uh, I guess for lack of a better way of putting it, one of the um, traditions of church we pray before we leave here. But we ought to pray uh, when we're getting off the phone with some people. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day with a group called, you know how to have those conference calls, and we were going to go. I said, let's pray before we go. And somebody said, Thomas, I always got to pray. And I thought about this verse. I said, you got to pray uh, because we don't know when we'll see each other again. We don't know the next time we can connect. But what we're praying for is not out of sorrow. We're praying out of God's blessings, out of God's provision and power. So I can imagine them. Lord, we know that uh, Paul is going to Jerusalem. We know his trouble there. But Lord, would you protect him? Lord, would you keep him? Lord, would you give him all that he needs on his way to the destination uh, that you have pre- prevailed and dictated in his life? So they came together and prayed. So in Acts 21, verse 6, the Bible continues and says, When we are taken, um, I will leave one of another. We took ship, and they returned home again. And so they said goodbye, verse 6. Um, the people of Tyre went back home, and Paul and his travel companions continued on their journey to the next location. Verse 7, and I'm in Acts chapter 21. When we had finished our course, in other words, when they had set sail from Tyre, and they were on their way to the next city. The Bible says that they came to a city, I mean, verse 7 says, Ptolemus. And when they got to Ptolemus, they saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. Now, if y'all see a theme here, every city Paul goes to, what does he do? He stops and connects with the believers. Uh, again, Paul wasn't doing that because he wanted to pat him on his back and say, oh, Paul, is great. Paul had a heartfelt desire for every individual Christian in every church that was planted, whether he planted it or not, to come together uh, and grow in the Lord. And again, that is a hallmark and the foundation of a Christian church that our desire ought to be that everyone grows in the Lord. We should never be satisfied with somebody um, knowing the Lord in a limited uh, edition, in a limited way. We should always want every one of us, ourselves included, to know more and more about the Lord. Paul didn't just say that's what he was going to do. Paul, in fact, did it. He got to another city, and, and again, Throughout Acts, we've never seen the fact that somebody visited Ptolemus. Peter and John did. Paul and uh, Silas did. not Paul and Barnabas did. not Yet, guess what happened? The body of Christ has continued to grow. I want to pause. I thought about this earlier today as I was reading over this verse again. Sometimes uh, it is very easy for the Christians to feel like uh, there's a limited number of Christians. But the reality is uh, there's the possibility and potential for a great number of Christians as people are willing to share Christ. In other words, uh, we, we may look around and say, ain't nobody been saved but me. But the reality is everybody in the, in the place could be saved and we're willing to do what? Share Christ with other people wherever we are. I'm not necessarily saying that you need to pull up in front of public and Kroger and preach, but if the Lord leads you to do it, you ought to pull up in front of public and preach. But what I am saying is wherever you are, if the Spirit of God moves you, share Christ there. The church... Um, as we look at it here in the book of Acts, spread through the evangelism and the, and the missionary work of Paul and Silas and all the other disciples as well, apostles and then other disciples and even the deacons. It grew all through those methodologies. But sometimes, a lot of times, it was disciples telling other people about who they knew in Christ and what happened in their life as a result of knowing Christ for themselves. And so that's what Paul is doing here uh, in, verse, in both in verse um, 4 and verse 7. He is pausing to take time to share Christ and encourage those who are in Christ um, to continue on their way. If we can go back for a minute, when Barnabas went down to the city of Antioch, when he got there, he saw people in Christ was bad, and when he saw them in Christ, what did he do? He didn't just say, oh, this is great. He did what? He encouraged them. He was happy, but he encouraged them to do what? Save the course and continue to follow Jesus Christ. That sometimes is the most important work that sometimes even as pastors do is to keep tell people to keep on walking, keep on trusting, keep on believing, and watch what God will do in your life. Now, we're getting to verse 8. We're, we're, we're going to stack this together. Uh, verse 8 says, and the next day, in other words, the day after they stopped at a city called Tolemus, uh, that they were a Paul, that the group, Paul's company, his contingent, they left Tolemus, so they stayed there overnight. And they came to the city of Caesarea. We are familiar, familiar with Caesarea. Um, it was a, a, a thriving city. It was a city uh, that Mark Phillips, the deacon, had gone to after he had left um, evangelizing and sharing Christ uh, with, with the eunuch. And so um, Paul is here. So they go to Caesarea. In Caesarea, Paul knew who to call. The Bible says that when they got to Caesarea, they entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist. Y'all remember Philip? Philip was the one that went down to Samaria. And, and shared Christ in Samaria. 
And the Bible says, as a result of the people of Samaria coming to know Jesus, there was great joy in the city. Philip was the one that was led by the Spirit of God to the desert so that he could have an encounter with the eunuch. And he led that eunuch to Christ and baptized him as well. Now Philip uh, has grown older now, but he's settled in a city called Caesarea. And when he gets to Caesarea, Paul, I'm sure, had gotten word that Philip was in Caesarea. And Philip now has become, and I like this title, Philip the Evangelist. Philip now, his whole work was to shout, to cast a net so that people will come to know Jesus for themselves. The Bible lets us know for sure who he is because it says Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven. The seven who? He was one of the first seven deacons that were ever called. And so as a result of his calling, as a result of his ministry, uh, he has a name that's recorded in the Word of God, but not just because of, of that work, but because of his continuing work. It says they went into the house of Philip the Evangelist. He was one of the seven. And they did what? They stayed with him. They abode with him. Now, while they were in Philip's house, I want y'all to look at this picture. Um, this man, Philip, had four daughters, all who were virgins, and they had the gift of prophecy. Let me pause here and just share that gift. The gift of prophecy is not of, of necessarily of, of saying something ain't nobody else known, but it's really a gift that confirms something that God has already said. Prophecy is a gift of, of revelation. It's some sharing something. And, and the key about rep, of prophecy, it is always going to be congruent with the Word of God. If somebody prophesies to you something that you can't be, it's not in the Word of God, that's not a prophecy. In other words, a prophecy ain't, if you rob that bank, you know, you'll get rich. That's not prophecy. That's just somebody talking to you. Prophecy would always be congruent with the Word of God. It would always go along. It would always be uh, tied in with the Word of God. And, and, it, and in, in many cases, it, it, it serves the, the work of revealing or confirming, I should say, with somebody who has already heard a message from the Lord. And so sometimes, and I'm saying this um, uh, preemptively because the Lord is doing a great work in this season. And the Lord is doing a specific work. He does great work in every season. If you're doing a specific work in this season, uh, a prophet may come to you, and you may be around like, I don't know if I'm supposed to do this. I don't know if I'm supposed to do this. prophet may come to you and say, Lord told me to tell you that this is what you're supposed to be doing. It's going to confirm what God has said. Let me do a quick story uh, about this. Some of you I may have heard this, and most of you I probably did. Uh, my second year as pastor, the Lord gave me uh, instruction to do a specific thing here at St. Peter. And I didn't want to do it because I didn't feel like busting. I didn't want nobody to tell me no not to do it. So I was like, I'm going to do it. And so I had gone to Detroit. Uh, for a conference. When I was in Detroit, unfortunately, one of the members died, and I, was, I came back to Atlanta for the funeral. So I got to the funeral, I looked at the program, and the program had, for um, for reading of the scripture, uh, um, prophet is so-and-so, so-and-so. And I was thinking, man, I don't want to be bothered with prophet. Man, I got to be bothered with that. I'm being honest with y'all. I was like, I'm not doing it. I'm not talking to her. So I got came, I preached the eulogy. We went to the cemetery, and the lady tried to come talk to me, and I found somebody to talk to. We came back to the church. We would eat, I, I would get my fried chicken, mashed potatoes, green beans, and my cornbread, as I was my normal custom after the funeral. And I was eating dinner, and the lady came to meet me, and I went to my office. So after I went to my office, it got closed the door. I thought I was done for the day. The next thing I know, knocked on the door, and do, I opened the door, and it was the lady, the property, and she said, Lord, told me to tell you this. And I just started crying, because I knew that what she said was what the Lord had told me. She confirmed what the Lord had told me. I didn't know her. She had no way of knowing what it was that God had told me other than God had told her. So I invited her to my office. I apologized uh, to her, and I realized that the gift of prophecy exists. Now, I'm going to be clear. It's not one of, it's, prophecy is not one of those things that can be used. It's not something that can be used. It's not just a, to, 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 it's not glamorous. It's a gift that edifies. Does that, that make sense? It edifies. If somebody prophesies you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to strengthen you uh, as a result of what God has said. But remember what I said. It has to be congruent with the Word of God. It's never going to be and at the status of the Word of God, it's always going to be something you did that's congruent with who God is, the nature of God, and what God's Word says. Anyway, here in this verse here, this man had four daughters who were virgins, and they did have the gift of prophecy. They prophesied. And so Paul, uh, Luke says that they tarried there many days. They stayed in Philip's house many days. Again, for the purpose of what? Edifying the believers there in Caesarea. But while they tarried there, the Bible says they came from Judea, a certain prophet, a man named Agabus. Now listen to this. This is a unique um, uh, confrontation or encounter, I should say, uh, that, that Paul had. So this prophet named Agabus came down. And when Agabus came down uh, to Paul and Luke and the other traveling group, he took Paul's girdle. That means he took Paul's belt. And he, tied, and he bound his own hands and feet and said unto Paul, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews that Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle. So think about this. Think about me, and he took Paul's belt and tied his, his hands and his feet up. And he said, the Holy Ghost told me 
that the Jews of Jerusalem are going to do this right here to you, whoever this girl belongs, this belt belongs to, and it belongs to Paul. And so he, and then he said, and, and in addition, he said, and that shall deliver this man into the hands of the Gentiles. This is the prophet of Paul. When you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be taken into custody. You're going to have your hands and feet bound, and you're going to be turned over by the Jews into the Gentiles. Paul, that's your destiny. Now let me pause here again. This is the second time now that Paul has heard, although God had already told him when he went to Jerusalem he's going to have trouble, but this is the second time that Paul hears this message that Jerusalem held some challenging bad things. Now, for the longest time, as I read this over and over again, I tried to figure out, well, wonder why Paul kept going and wonder what was God trying to tell him. As I look at it, now I understand that God was trying to confirm with Paul, you will have trouble there. But he wasn't trying to tell Paul not to go. He was simply telling Paul that understand you're going to have a challenging time when you get to Jerusalem. The Bible says that after this message was given, and let me say this, this man Agabus, this wasn't what he did. In and of itself wasn't unique because in the Old Testament, oftentimes prophets, as they prophesied, would use visual aids to make sure that people understood the clarity of the prophecy. Uh, we understand Ezekiel used uh, visual aids, or Jeremiah, they all used visual aids to demonstrate what God was saying to them, and this is what Agabus did here. And so if there was ever any question that Paul was going to face challenges in Jerusalem, guess what? It has become very clear now that trouble waited on him. Verse 12 says that when they heard these things, when they heard this, this prophecy, when they saw the demonstration that Agabus gave, uh, his Bible says, both we, meaning Luke says, all of us, and they that are the place, being called not to go up to Jerusalem. In other words, they had a quick meeting and said, man, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, somebody said, now he showed up. Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Whatever you do, let's just do something else. Let's go somewhere else. There's still a lot of work to be done other places. Paul said, no, i got to go where the Lord tells me to go. What does that tell us as individual Christians? When God tells us to do something, no matter what anybody else says, it's important for us to obey who? Oh, that was real quiet. Let's try that one more time. When we get a message from the Lord, no matter what anybody else says, what should, who should we follow? God. That's who we need to follow. And, and I said this a few Sundays ago. Sometimes the way we want to go may be expedient. It may seem easier. But it's more important to go through and where God wants us to go through that he may prepare us for what he has for us than taking the easy way out. Back in the book of um, in, uh, back in the book of Exodus, the children of Israel, when they came out of bondage, to the valley, they could have just walked straight on over to the promised land, couldn't they? But God took them a roundabout way. Why? Because that roundabout way was what it took to get them ready to experience what God promised. Likewise, our lives, sometimes God may take you the long route, or it may be a slow route, or sometimes it may be because we are doing our own thing. God says, okay, I tell you what, you do your thing, I'm going to do my thing. But you're not going where I want you to go until you find what my thing is. The bottom line is that God is sovereign, and what we must follow more than anything else is what God said. Paul could have said, you know what, i tell you what, y'all said I'm going to hang and go, but Paul didn't say that. Paul said in verse 13, uh, what mean ye to weep and to break my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but I'm also ready to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul said, I know without a doubt, I'm ready to give it all up for who? For Jesus Christ. He said, I, y'all, y'all crying and y'all weeping and I hear you. He said, but all you're doing is kind of making me sad, but the reality is I'm still going to do what God has called me to do. And frankly, that ought to be the position, the possible. Somebody can say, well, I ain't Paul. But the reality is, we are all children of God, just like Paul. And so, just as surely as God had something in store for Paul, he had something in store for us. But the reality is, Paul didn't look at Jerusalem as being the place he would be killed. He looked at the place that he would give up everything he had for the Lord. And that's a different position, perspective. Paul didn't say, I'm going to Jerusalem because these folks are going to jump on me. He said, I'm going to Jerusalem because God sent me there. And I have work to do there. That means that oftentimes there needs to be other things that we put aside in our lives to make sure that we make room for God to be able to do what he wants to us. Sometimes we have to lay aside even our feelings and emotions uh, and so that we may experience Even sometimes our physicality, we must lay these things aside so that God's will will be done in our lives. How many believe, how many believe in here that God has a purpose for your life, a purpose? He got something for you. And how many understand that accomplishing that purpose not only uh, is a blessing to you, but it glorifies God? That's, that's what it does. That's what we must understand. And so Paul has made this declaration just as surely as Jesus said it, uh, the, my meat is do the will of him um, that sent me in the garden of Gethsemane. He said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. That's essential for the Christians to be able to lay aside how we feel 
and come under the under the guidance and the authority of, of the Holy Spirit of the work and the will of God. Verse 14 says this. Paul would not be persuaded. They couldn't convince Paul to not go. So the, Paul Luke said, we stopped crying. We ceased and said, the will of the Lord be done. They got it. Sometimes it, it, being an example is always a good thing. Uh, Paul was such an example that I can imagine uh, that many of those people who were there uh, found themselves fired up about doing what? The will of God. They said, let the will of God be done. And can I tell somebody, that's what's going to be done anyway. The question is, do you experience what God is doing during that process or don't you? That's the main thing. The will of God is always going to be done. Verse 4, 15, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tie this together just a minute. After these days, we took up our characters and went up to Jerusalem. So now they had reached a point in their journey where there was no more need for overseas travel. They had land travel now. So they got up in their carriages, and they went up to Jerusalem. Now, verse 16 says that while they were there, there went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea. It is as if every place Paul stopped, people would join in. So Paul might start off with just him and, him and, um, him and um, 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 Silas. But then he had Timothy. Then he comes Luke. And then pretty soon everybody went, somebody else said, I'm on board. So Paul started off maybe with a fourth door, and now he got a whole busload of people doing what? Traveling to Jerusalem. Every time he stopped, somebody else said, I'll go as well. The servant of the disciples at Caesarea went with them, and they brought with them one Nathan of Cyprus, an old disciple. I wonder what that means. That I mean he was, had been a disciple a long time, and he was just old. He was original. He was back in the day disciple. Look, I like that. He was, a, he was an old, original disciple. I ain't going to say old. He was an original disciple. He was an original disciple. Uh, and, 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 and as a result, he went with them. Uh, and, I'm sorry, he was there, and they stayed at his house. In other words, I can imagine that this man had a reputation of being a, a child of God, a, a, a disciple. And as a result, they stayed in his home. Now watch this. Watch what happens now. When we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. So when they got to Jerusalem, the brothers, what does that mean? All the other disciples were glad to see Paul and his traveling companions. They had a room and rooms booked for them in Nathan's house. They came there, and everybody had a good reunion. They had a good homecoming as Paul came back to Jerusalem. I can imagine that some people with Paul said, uh, this is going to be all right. It ain't so bad. But guess what happens next? The day following, verse 18, Paul went in with us unto James. Let me pause here. James, this James, is the brother of Jesus. And at this time, he was the leader of the church. Um, when they went into James, all the elders were present. That means all of those, I guess another way again, is the original. So those who had, who had come to Christ and followed Christ and had found themselves in, in positions of leadership and authority. And so Paul, who had seen James and these elders for a long time, matter of fact, the last time Paul saw them was back around about verse 15 when they kind of had a little issue with Paul. Paul is now coming back to them after having spent years and years of uh, doing the work and will of God by evangelizing and telling Christ, everyone about Christ. So they came into this meeting with James and the other elders. And verse 19 says, and we need to salute them. When he greeted all of them, he declared particularly. What does this mean? That means he declared in detail what things God had done among the Gentiles during his ministry. Again, let me say this. This wasn't Paul bragging. Paul was simply sharing that this is what God did when I was in this city and that city, Antioch, and all these great, all these cities. He said, "This is what the Lord did in this area during my 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 presence there." Paul was saying it was him. He said, "Look what God did." That's what he was saying. Look what God did. Verse twenty. Uh, many of them, and again, there was no CNN, there was no Facebook, Instagram. Nobody was posting it. When they heard about it, verse 20 says, they glorified the Lord. Can you imagine the praise party broke out? A praise party broke out among the elders of the church about people who they didn't know, had never seen, and may never see, come to know Christ. Shouldn't the church be excited whenever somebody comes to Christ? Because most of the time we'll see them next Sunday, we give them a call during the week. Uh, Paul is saying here that there was a joy when anybody comes to Christ. They were excited. They praised God for what he had done. When we see what God is doing, I don't care where you are, you ought to pause and say, thank you, Lord. If you see God moving in your life, you ought to stop what you're doing and say, thank you, Lord. If you realize that you are stronger now than you were six months ago, you ought to say, thank you, Lord. If you realize that what you're going through today might have knocked you down six months ago, you ought to say, thank you. If you realize that you're receiving blessings, you didn't even realize that you didn't even ask for it. You forgot you had asked the Lord for it. 
you ought to pause and say thank you. There's not a day gone by here lately that I have not been able to stop and think about something that God has done. And, and I think that as I've done it, I've become more deliberate and pausing every day to think about how God is doing. It's a refreshing thing. It's a joyful thing to be able to pause and, and realize what God is doing. Now, I've been listening to that song. I also came, he came out here. He sent to me this morning, Dick Brown. I see evidence of God's movement all over our lives, all over our lives. See, I like the other part. I've seen evidence of, of fulfillment of his promises. When we see God do that, we can't take it for granted. When God moves in our lives, the first thing we ought to do is to be grateful to God for what he is doing in our lives. I don't care if it's big or small, whatever it is. Let's be grateful for whatever God has done. Somebody say amen. All right. Last thing I'm going to talk on about tonight um, is that when they started rejoicing and glorified God, they said it to him, See, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all jealous of the law. When they heard it, they glorified God and said it to him. They said to Paul, Paul, look here. You see, there's so many thousands of Jews, thousands of Jews, which believe now, and they're all jealous of the law. Now, that's an interesting context. They're almost, in some ways, minimizing what Paul has done, but in other ways, they kind of kind of put some, put some hammer bars on it because they're telling Paul that Jews are coming to Christ as well, and they're still jealous of the law. Verse 21, let's see if you put this together. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest, y'all, thou, y'all teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Then they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after their custom. What is it then? The, verse 22, the multitude must needs come together, for they shall hear that thou art come. Now, here's where Paul's trouble begins. Because they're, they're, this, this is where the trouble starts right here. Because everybody is excited about the Gentiles coming to Christ, but then they hit him with some tradition. They hit him with some, but it's always been this way. They hit him with a little, this is what the law say. So they told Paul, be careful now. You need to try to be ready to answer this question. Because the Jews have heard that you're telling the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Now they had dealt with this before, but apparently, for whatever reason, James didn't stick to the plan. And he said that you're telling them they ought not to circumcise their children. He could walk, neither walk after their cousin. He said somebody got to say something to the multitude. But they were here to die come. Paul, if somebody don't go out there and fix this, it's going to be some trouble. Verse 23 says, Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have avowed them. Take them and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things which whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly or keepest the law. Now this is, this is complex. I'm, I'm going to end this tonight. This is the biggest challenge, so to speak, that Paul had faced. Paul had faced people trying to kill him. Paul had faced people trying to beat him up. Paul had been beat up. Paul had been, they tried to kill him. They put him in jail at least two times. Paul had dealt with some serious issues. But this issue is equally as serious because in this situation, church folk were going to attack Paul. They wanted Paul to shave his head. And he had done it before. But he did it before for the purpose of being able to identify with people so they may come to Christ. Now they're saying, Paul, shave your head, purify thyself, so they'll know you're still um, one of them. And, and if we look at the church today in 2023, it is important for the church to not to be bound up and say that a person has to have a certain background in order to be saved. It, it's important for the church to not look at somebody and say that they're going to have to act like us in order to be saved. Receiving Jesus Christ is salvation. If you believe that Jesus died for you and that God raised him from the dead, therefore are you saved. Your salvation is not based on what church you grew up in, what neighborhood you grew up in, certainly not by how much money you got, how much education you have, and certainly not based upon how you 
by the Roman government, but he was betrayed by the Jews. He may have been held hostage by Rome and may have been put to death by Rome, but what caused this problem was that there were people who were so desirous of condition being met that they missed out on the opportunity that Paul was doing by telling people who had no concept of Jesus about him as they believed. I'm going to pause here tonight, but I want to leave us with this prayer that as St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church, family and friends, that we begin to look at everybody as a candidate for salvation. Can we do that? Everybody is a candidate for salvation. Jesus didn't die for folk in the church. He died for the world. The Bible says, for God so loved the Okay, everybody know that. Let's try it again. For God so loved the that he gave his only begotten son. And so let us be prayerful then. Let's, let's go beyond just being open. Let's be prayerful that people around us may get to know Christ by our witness, by our testimony, and not be concerned about their background because thank God you were concerned about ours. Sister Val? That's correct. That's, that's exactly right. And, that, and that's true. And I think that's why Paul was able to say with such boldness in the book of Romans, you know, how he was expressing that don't, that, that whatever you need to change, don't let what you do be a stumbling block for somebody that's coming to Christ. And, and, that's, and let, us, let us keep that in mind as well. Let us not engage in anything that will keep anybody from coming to know Christ for themselves. I'm going to pause here tonight. I've been a long time tonight. Y'all got, a, y'all got 47 minutes. I'm sorry. Um, but I, y'all had to, to work with that one. But I'm grateful for those of y'all who came, who came tonight. Uh, let us be excited about what God is doing in our midst, and let us be excited about what God, what God is doing for us and through us. Let us be just as excited as Paul was to encourage others in Christ, as we know more of what we know in Christ. Like somebody said today, well, you gotta know you got to know a lot about Christ to share Christ. No, you can share what you know about Christ. And if you share what you know, guess what? God will give you some more so you can share some more. God bless you tonight. I thank God for you. Uh, let us close the prayer tonight. Father, in Jesus' name, we love you. We thank you and we praise you. And we thank you, Lord, for 47 minutes that you've given us tonight to study your word. I pray, God, that you would pour down special blessings upon those who left home and came from work and stopped by here tonight to, to hear your word and to be in person, Lord, to, to have an encounter with you. And I pray, God, for those on the phone and those who are tuning in uh, virtually, Lord, that you touch their hearts and minds as well. That they would open their hearts and minds be open. They would not only have received your word tonight, but apply it to all of our, to their lives. I pray, God, tonight that we dismiss from this place, that you keep your hands on us, and God, let us keep our eyes on you. God, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you tonight. Thank you for coming. In. Hey, just wait for somebody else. Hey. Good night, everyone.